All right. Uh, welcome back, everybody. Hope you had your coffee, tea, whatever you had gone for, and hope the second day is going well. And looks like the second day is equally packed with great speakers and great content. And here is another one for all of you. And we're truly honored, and it's incredible to host Erland Somerskog. And let me, I whatever I talk about him and whatever I say about him is going to be just to. too short and too less so orland has been a long time friend and uh, of course someone who has been working with sequel server since 1991 which means friends in 2021 next year if we all get to see next year sorry sorry for saying that because the way the world situation is you could say anything so if we get to see next year 2021 this is going to be someone uh, amongst us an mvp also for with 30 years of sequel server experience and he is also one of the longest uh, time mvp microsoft most valuable professional for sequel server since 2001 which means 20 years as mvp 30 years with sequel server experience we have a legend amongst us so to say and i can tell you uh, just not by these mere numbers but the kind of content he has written on his blog posts is just as good as the number of books you can see behind him in his video right so that's earned for all of us and his session sequel tidbits for the inexperienced and i'll tell you even if you have 10 or 15 years of experience you should still attend this session because you're going to get a lot of every anything that he speaks about or talks about or the way he puts these concepts forward so it's great it's a, it's an honor for this event to have someone like erlen join us erlen thank you so much for taking out time and over to you all right so i just going to share my screen okay someone has to unshare yes i will do that now yes okay Good. now you now. can yeah so <clears throat> so you see my screen absolutely great so yeah welcome then to this session as as going to in experience and of course a big thanks to amit for that introduction um the awesome people i know that for example tibo karas another guy here in sweden he was an mvp named an mvp before me and he started working with sql server i believe already in the 1980s so i'm a newcomer in this game Um, so anyway, this session is entitled "SQL Tidbits for the Inexperienced," and I will start like to start to tell with how this session came about. So, you see, I answer a lot of a lot of questions in various SQL forums, particularly on MSDN, and there are some stuff I see reoccurring. People, new people, they ask the same questions, they make the same mistakes, they have the same misconceptions. So I figured I should do a session about some of these. because if i would do a session of all things i've seen and regularly seen i would be talking for more or less the entire day so my idea here is this even if i admit said if you even if you have 10 15 years of experience this session is intended for people who have done sql like left handedly for a year or, or two maybe but as i said not focus in sql your main focus is like writing um being a developer or maybe a business person but i would say though that This is slightly more directed towards the developers than business users because I will make some connections to other languages, but you have not. So there's a lot of things you're using in SQL, but a lot of things is mysterious to you. Some things you use, but you don't really understand how they work, and some mistakes you make, and some mistakes you have yet to make. And maybe I will save you from making these mistakes today. Who knows? Um, so and the first things I will present are they are really basic and some of you might say I know this already but the level will rise a little bit as we go on but still staying within the level of a of a novice user. I I should also say the way I'm going to present these tips bits I will start with the demo in management studio and then sum them up on the slides. Um I also have a bio slide here that I I hardly need it now since I'm it presented me but I live in Stockholm where I work as independent consultant I have have been in the P for many years I have a website somasgo.se which is a well small collection of large articles that discuss a couple of topics that go uh, in depth and some of them well none of them are really advanced but maybe not really exactly novice use but for example there is one on dynamic SQL which is an area I sometimes see I'm not going to talk about dynamic SQL today but that's an area I see people sometimes walking too early and i think that's quite advanced topics um anyway there's also my email address sqlsomasco.se so if you get a question after the session you want you please feel free to reach out to me um so you find slides and scripts for this presentation on my website somasco.se/present they are also available on the data platform geeks site i don't really have the the link for that but you can find them there as well so 
Um, also, before I go on, I'd like to extend a big thanks for the knowledge part of Data Platform Geeks, because without sponsors, well, these kind of events getting paying for Zoom, et cetera, et cetera, even if we don't have a host, it still takes time and, and effort to arrange this. So big thanks to these people or these companies, and also big thanks to the people behind Data Platform Geeks for making this event possible. So let's move on. These are the tits bits kind of agenda. These are the... So that we'll talk about. So go is not an SQL statement. I will talk about null values and the not in trap. I will talk about the case expression. I will dis um, make a brief discussion about data types in the SQL Server. I will talk about union and union all. I will talk about CT and derived tables, a, a topic I see many people being sort of confused over, something like it, it's magic. And I will try to unveil some of that not so magic things actually. And I will also talk about temp tables and table variables. So let's talk about this. Go is not an SQL statement. So we'll start Open Management Studio. And here is a very, very simple script. You can see the same piece of code appears twice. You may also note this, that every um, statement or every line is terminated by a semicolon, except for this one. So first of all, what is the store by semicolons in SQL? So in standard SQL, semicolons are mandatory statement terminators, like in many other languages. However, when Sybase originally designed TSQL way back in the 80s, they thought, ah, semicolons, that's for wimps. So they did not, did not even permit semicolons. When Microsoft and Sybase parted ways, at some point Microsoft, oh, let's, let's follow the standard. So they made semicolons at least um, allowed. And as a matter of fact, it's now deprecated not using semicolons, but it's not enforced. So we don't have to put semicolons on every line. And I, I'm going to admit, I'm not very good at putting semicolons at the end of my statements. However, this line go here does not have a semicolon. Why? <clears throat> because this is not an SQL statement. This is an instruction to Management Studio. When I send this, Management Studio will send this part, wait for response from SQL Server, and then this part. Now look here, this one does a select, produces a result set, then waits for two seconds. Let's see now what happens when I press execute. There is no results at all, although I said select, but now it arrived, it took two seconds, and this one also arrived two seconds later. And that is because the output is buffered. And to enforce this a little more, let's say I put a semicolon here. Now I get an error because Management Studio looks for go alone on the line. It can be followed by a number to repeat things, but the semicolon, Management Studio thinks, no, no, this is not for me. And as Server here says, go? What do you mean by that? That doesn't fit in here. So, and I can also, let's say, I can just comment out this go. And I still get an error because the variable name at D has already been declared. That didn't happen the first time because it's conserved first to this part and then this part. But now it sees all at once and this is an error. So I'm going to change the variable name so I can run all at once. And now look how long that time does it take before we get the data. It doesn't take two seconds. It takes four seconds, but then we get them both at once because now SQL Server saw everything at one go. So just to repeat, go, that is not an SQL statement. It's a batch separator. That's SQL Server never sees, but it's an instruction to the query tool to split up the script in batches. Yes, query tool, worth pointing out. This is nothing special for Management Studio as such, but every query tool that there has been with SQL Server all through the way back in the 1980s, has used this convention with Go. But it's just a convention. And as a matter of fact, you can even replace Go with something else, but don't do that. Uh, that is, you can, you can configure the tool to use something else. So anyway, the tool sends the, the text up to the first Go, SQL Server waits for it, and to SQL Server waits for response. And when that batch has completed, the tool sends up the next batch and so on. Um, here is also a kind of animation to demonstrate this. So. Management Studio sends this, it's good server, produces the result set, slight delay. Now it's sent to Management Studio, which sends the next one, the result set, slight delay, and so it's done. A few more notes about Go. Uh, so it's a tool understood, uh, it's a, sorry, it's a convention understood by query tools, but the client APIs, those do not understand Go. So if you're writing a program, and let's say in C Sharp, Java, etc., and you read a script with Go in it, the client API is not going to, going to understand that, but it will send everything you pass to it in one single batch to SQL Server. And SQL Server will say, go, what's that? That's a syntax error. So if you 
do, need to do this, you need to pass that out that Go itself. And of course, that's very simple. It's Go along alone on the line, unless you want to handle also Go embedded in comments. It might, it might be commented out by a multi-line comment or a, a string literal, but that's a little more advanced and you don't always have to do that. Um, there are a few statements that must be in a batch of their own. So the most common ones are create procedure, create function, create view, create trigger. So if you say print, create my procedure, and then directly say create procedure, it's because serve, server will tell you, no, no, you can't do that. And moreover, since it must be a batch of their own, it's a single batch, so go will always mark the end of your store procedure. Sometimes I'm seeing unfortunate uses there on the forums that while well, they type, have create procedure, and they have a, number, a bit of code, all that code was supposed to be part of the procedure, but right in the middle of it, they have a go. So the procedure was not as long as they had intended. Now let's move over to talk about null values. This is something which is truly bewildering when you're completely new to a skill because this, you don't find anything like this in the other, in the other environments that I know of. So I got, a, I got a demo database here called SQL Titbits. It's a very simple database, it's just a collection of some random tables. I got a customer's table here. And there's a customer ID, there's a customer name, a street address, a city and a country. And that, there is also a cost press by D column we're going to work with. And you can see there are null values here. Now, most of us will probably understand these null values to mean that, okay, this guy, um, Gustavo Mazzetti, for example, in Argentina, he does not have a cost responsible. Or no, nor does Sunita Kulkar in the Impuna have one, et cetera. So, but that's how we would understand it. And probably most of the time when we use null, we do assign a meaning to null to mean something spe spe specific. But a school server has a general meaning, which we're gonna have a look at in a second. So I wanna find now, I'm very new to SQL, and I wanna find the cu uh, customers who don't have a customer responsible. So very naturally, I write select star from the builder customers where cost press by D equals null. That seems natural to write. But I get back no results, although I saw that there were there were customers without responsibles. Okay, then I try select star from customers where cost press by D is different from null because maybe something has changed, but there's still no rows. Why? Well, so the thinking in SQL is that null represents an unknown value. So this null could or could not be equal to the value we're comparing to. We don't know. Therefore, the outcome of this condition, it's not true, it's not false, it's unknown. So this is the three value logic of SQL, which is, well, take some time to wrap your hand, wrap, hand around, but is very practical in the long run. So therefore, and where will only include rows if the condition is true. So to find the rows values without, if you want to find the rows without the customer responsible, we have to use this, is null. Now we get back those. And well, let's consider things is that, well, we don't know if this guy, maybe he has a customer responsible, but we don't know who it is. That is sort of the general meaning, the general thinking is SQL. And I can also use is not null to find the ones that, that do have a customer responsible. And just to drive this point a little more, it's no different if you make the comparison with a, comparison with a variable. Same thing here. I don't get back in the rows. Or if I make a join here, I fill a table variable with the values four, seven, and null, thinking I will find those with custom responsible four and seven, or none at all. But I only get back those with four and seven. So null represents an unknown value. And SQL has three truth values, true, false, and unknown. The operators equals, not equals, greater than equal, etc. they yield unknown when you compare with null. And the thinking is this, that the null may or may not be the same as the value you're comparing to. Because it's unknown, well, we don't know. And where and on will only include the row if the condition is true. And you need to use is null and is not null to check for a null in a column or variable. Uh, and here is the truth table for SQL. And we're going to use this in the next demo. So we have here that first the four lines are the ones we know or love, false and, lo false and true, etc., and 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 all. Now, if we take the combination with false on one side and unknown on the other side, well, if we take false and unknown, well, that's still false because with and, if one side is false, we know it is false. But false or unknown, well, we don't know. This unknown could actually be true or false. If we take the combination of true and unknown, well, true and unknown, well, we don't know because for and, both sides have to be true. And now, well, we don't know. But with true or unknown, no problem. It is true because one side is true. 
if we have unknown on both sides, well, unknown and unknown, or unknown or unknown, well, still unknown. And if we take not unknown, it's still unknown. That's the way it works. So we're going to use this now. We're going to look at the not in trap. And this is something about every SQL user at some point in their career walked into, made this mistake. I don't remember when I did it, but I'm sure I've done it. Uh, so in a way, I got a table here with the custom responsibles. The ones we saw, in the, those are the numbers we saw in the previous demo. And we got a couple of people here. And I can run sort of queries here. For example, I want to find the custom responsibles who are located as the same in the, sorry, who are located in, a, in the same city as there is a customer. So it's quite natural to write this. Select star from DBO dot custom responsibles, where location in, select city from DBO customers. This is a very simple query to write because you can take this query and then compose it with this one. So it's, it's very natural to write. And you see, I get back three of these cases. And then I can say, okay, I want to find the custom responsibles who are not located in a city as there is a customer. So it's the same thing, but only not in instead. Works very well, and now I get back the other six. Then I say, okay, I want to find the custom responsibles who actually are responsible for a customer. So it's the same type of query, cost press by D in, select, select cost press by D from the above the customers. And I get back seven. Okay, I want to find the custom responsibles who are not responsible for a customer. So I'll write this query, very natural, change in to not in. But I'm in for a surprise, because there are no rows coming back. What's going on? Well, let's take a look at it a little more closer. First of all, let's take a look at what this subquery returns, although I'm going to add distinct here, so I'll make it a little clear. And you see one, two, three, four, six, seven, nine, and null. So what does this really mean? Well, we can uh, take this results it and change this to in because that's the same thing. And then we move the uh, not in to the, to the outside. But if you have an in like this, this is actually a shortcut for cost press by D equals one or cost press by S by D equal two or et cetera, and or cost press by D equal null. Let's now try it for five, which is missing here. Well, five, is that equal to one? No, false. It's equal to two, false, et cetera. False, 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 equal to null. Oh, we don't know. So remember the truth table, true or unknown. No, let's see, false or, sorry. False or unknown. Well, that's unknown and not unknown. That's unknown. So no, this row is filtered out because the condition is unknown. So this is the thing. If you have a not in, and the subquery returns a single null value, you're not going to get anything back. Even if there are one million rows with not null, single null will mean you get no rows back because the value you're comparing to could by chance be equal to that null value. We don't know. So there's a very simple workaround for this. You can simply add in the subquery, simply filter out the, the null values by adding cost press by the is not null. So now if I run this, I get back this. I get back two rows. However, there is a lot better way, in my opinion, because we can use another operator to it not exists. Some of you might have seen this. Some of you might have. It might be uh, for some of you. This might be completely new. And um, this one takes a little time to get wrap your head around, but it's extremely useful. So what is happening here logically is that for every row in the outer query, the subquery is evaluated. We have a correlation here, and in this case, since we have not exist, if it does not return any rows at all, the condition will be true and the row from the outer table will be included. So I can run this and I get back five and eight. Note here how this, this query, that's C cost space by D equals CR cost space by D. So it's a correlated subquery. And I can also use this with exists. So now I will get, this will return true if, 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 if this subquery returns a row for the row in the outer table. And I get back seven. Now you might think, yeah, but this sounds inefficient. It, it's run for every query in the outer table. That doesn't seem very good. The, the thing with the in is a lot better because it runs the query once. That's not really the case because keeping this in mind, SQL is a declarative language. We say uh, what result we want and the optimizer figures out how to do it. As it turns out, my experience is that this query and this query up here, 
they have the same career plan. They're completely equivalent. They will res result in the same thing. Because how it's done under the covers, that's another story. I'm only talking about the logical. Now, there are a few more things where they exist that are worth pointing out, which makes, uh, and uh, that's also the reason why exit is so powerful. Because within, you can handle one condition or one correlation there. But let's say you want to find the customer responsible who are located in the same city as a customer they are responsible for. Now we need to compare two things and how to do this within. I, I don't even know, but I know how to do it with exists because I can add as many conditions as I want here. So I can run this one and now oh, I only get back two. So there was one customer responsible who was living in the city someone else was responsible for apparently. Um, before I leave this, also I'd like to point out one more thing. So this, is, this one here is, is probably a mistake. You might note here, this one is not correlated to the other table. And sometimes I see people doing things like this, but an exist query should always have a correlation to the outer query. This query is very strange because it will return all customers in customer responsible if there is a single customer in Stockholm. And yes, there is. Good. But if I change this to, well, Uppsala, which is a bit up north here from Stockholm, I get back none at all. And this is sort of a flip thing. Either I get back all customer responsible or none at all. And if this sounds odd to you, well, it is. So if you see this kind of query, it's probably, something's probably wrong. It exists, should be correlated. So let's now repeat this. So this type of query, if you have not in, and this subquery here returns a single null value, you're not going to get any rows back because that null represents an unknown value. And it could be equal to the value we are comparing here to. We don't know. And therefore, using exists or not exists is a lot better. Well, for this case, not exists. You have a correlated subquery, which is logically evaluated for every row in the outer table. And exists or not exists will return true or false but never unknown it's completely boolean and not exists or exists is great for multi-column conditions where in or not in only takes you for one single simple conditions that is not going to deny that for the newcomer in and not in are a lot easier to write it does take some time to wrap your head around on this and if you didn't get this on my presentation i just try to go home try to, try to play with this and learn them i can tell you this i I, may be, I might use in every once in a while, but most of the time I use exists or not exists because they're so much, so much more powerful. And also remember this, uh, the where clause for it exists subquery should always have at least, at least one condition relating to the outer query. If you're missing that, it's going to be very binary one, all or nothing, which is rarely what you want. So let's now talk about the case expression. Yes, the case expression. Many languages have a case statement. SQL does not have a case statement. It has a case expression. And of course, sometimes when people say case statement, they might, well, they might just do it so out of habit. But sometimes also when people say case statement, they might think of it as a statement and that may lead them astray. So what this done does is that it, all the conditions that follow when are evaluated in order and the first value that follows then will then be returned. So when I run this, well, at n is one. So when I run this, I get back this big floating point number. And then I can change n to two. And now, so this one is false, but now this one is, is still true. So I will get back p, a system function. So you can see I can put various things here. And then I can make this into 10. So those conditions are false, but here you have a more complex condition. Well, n equals to two and at m bigger than two. Yeah. Okay, I can have an arithmetic expression here, like the square root of two plus one. And I get back this value. Uh, let's see, make this one negative. And I came down here, and if uh, at n modulus 2, that is, do I have an even number, I will run a subquery, and I can do that as well. And I will get back how many customers there are. But I can't run, put any subquery here. It has to be a subquery that returns a single row and a single column. So if I try this, I will get this error. Only one expression can be specified in the select list when the subquery is not introduced with exists. Or likewise, I can't have many rows being coming back. If I try that, I'll say select city for whatever reason. I want all the cities. No, no, I can't do that. Subquery return more than one value. So it has to be a single column, a single, ex ex single, column, a single row if you do a subquery here. 
And then I can put this one to, well, let's say 21. So now we come down here and I can do an exists with the subquery. Are there any customers in the city of Mokpo, which is in South Korea? Well, then, oh, there is another nested case statement. So let's look at this one. Well, at B has not been initialized. So it's not one. This is unknown. So we're not going to, and, then the, and it has to be returned true. So we're not going to run this function, my demo function, but I could do that. Or I, and it's not going to run this particular condition either because it's unknown. I'm not going to return null, but there is an else. So when all of the when has, have been exhausted, but there is an else, then I get back the value from the else. I get back minus one. And let's now make, let's see here. Yeah, I'm going to change the city to Berlin. There are no customers in Berlin. So what happens now? Well, all of these are false. And here in the outer case, there is no else. Well, then I get back null. So yes, in SQL, there is no case statement. There is a case expression. And the result of the case is the then or the first when condition that evaluates the true. They are evaluated in order. And if no, when evaluates are true, the result of case is the value for else or null if there is no else at all. And of course, one particularly then, as you saw, can also be followed by null. You want null explicitly there. Um, and then else must be followed by an expression that evaluates to single value, even if it's a subquery. You can't return multiple values. You can't run other queries. It's just a single scalar value. And no, you cannot call still procedures in a case. It's just a single expression. Now, I'm going to talk about data types. And this is a topic that is, well, I could probably make a, a, an entire begin, a session for beginners about data types. I'm just going to scrap the surface. So, um, I got my database here. And again, I got a table called config values. And you see here, this is a type of table that appears in, in the many systems um, where one, sh one shape or form. What really what it's all about is that you have a number of configuration parameters that are, well, are quite unrelated to each other. And the correct, the correct in quotes, the sign of such a table would be uh, one row and one column per value. But that's because you, you keep adding these configuration parameters. It's just not tenable. So most people tend to do this with one row per configuration values, and then the type of the sign varies a little bit. And this time we have an ID, we have a name, and we have a type column telling us that this is an integer parameter, these two are strings, this one is date, this one is date time, and this time is a width. Now, I want to write a I want to write a procedure that returns to the UI the value for one parameter, the ID, the name, the type, so I can, and the UI then can enforce the rules for the type, but I don't want to have different columns. I don't want to bog down the UI with that. So I want to return all these values in my case. I think that's a good idea. And this is a slightly different type of case. You see, I say case type, when int, when stir, when date. It's, it's just a shortcut for saying when type equals int, when type equals stir, etc. And you might see that I have commented out one guy and we, you will understand why in a short moment. So I create my procedure and I test it first for number five, which is the date time value, which I get back here. Great, works. I get back my, try my date value. Yeah, I get it back, there's a time portion, but okay, it's, I got, got, it, got it back. But when I run the integer value, now wait a minute, this is still a date, not supposed to be an integer. What, and that, what a funny day, 20th May, 1903. What's going on here? Hmm. Strange, let's try the string as well. Oh, now I get an error mes message. Conversion failed when converting date and or time from character string. What? I, I want a string back. I don't want a date back. But let's see now just to what happens if I also try to, oops, try to have the word here and try to recreate my procedure. Now I get an error message up front. Operand type clash, unique identifier is it compatible with data. What? Now, so this is the story. SQL is a statically typed language. This can sometimes be hidden because there are a lot of implicit conversions, but it is statically typed. So a case expression always return the one and the same data type. It's not going to return integers on Tuesdays, strings on Wednesday, etc. No, it's always one and the same data type. And which data type is it then? Well, so this is the story. In SQL, there is, or 
in TSQL, SQL Server, it's not standard SQL as far as I know, there is a precedence list which says, if we two types meet, well, this type is going to win. So that the higher up the list it is, that type is going to win. And of all these types here, the one that wins is daytime. So that's for the data type of this expression is daytime. Now, there is an implicit conversion, conversion from integer to daytime, from string to daytime, from day to daytime, but not for grid. There is no implicit, and not even explicit conversion because there is nothing with date and time in the grid. So that's always going to fail. But there are implicit conversions. So how I needed to resolve this? Well, I need to make sure they have the same data type. So the sort of proper way to do this, there is an alternative that we will look at later, but we can use this data type SQL variant, which is a data type that can hold a, or any, almost any other data type in SQL Server. And it also knows that the underlying value is an integer, is a, a string, etc. So now I can create my procedure this way, because now it returns a SQL variant. And all these five now runs, I get back my values. Now let's look at this a little more. Um, look here, I got, I'm looking at values in my string, but here I'm compa uh, comparing integer to a string, the string one, two, three, four. And here I'm comparing the string to the number one, two, three, four. Now, depending from where you come from, you might cringe or you might just say, oh, what's wrong with that? Because if you have been working, well, let's say you mainly would be working in Python or Perl, dynamically typed languages, you would think, what's wrong with this? But if you always would be working in Java, C Sharp, C++, which are strongly typed, wait a minute, you can't compare a string, an integer to a string. That's just wrong. They're completely unrelated. But when I run this, oops, if I run, select all of it, I get back my value because in SQL, there is implicit conversion between strings and numbers. So when I try this one, what happens now? Well, now I get an error message. It's, you see, it produced the results that it started executing, but then it gave up. Conversion failed when converting the varchar value, a string to date the tape int. And this is also something I see very common in the forum. People have problems with this. Because again, we have two types that meet. Then there is a, uh, the type with highest priority will win and it's integer wins over string. So therefore this one worked because this string was converted to a number, we looked it up. But here, this string column was converted to the number, but, but, but that's because there was this value, a string in the, that column, that failed. So this is almost bound to fail unless you're very lucky. And it's also worth pointing out because I sometimes see people who put quotes around numbers when they should and vice versa. Now we can tell this, this is a number, this is a string, and we can tell they are different. This one is red, this one is black. But not only that, if we would go in and look inside the computer, they are stored in a very, very different way. The bit patterns for these two are nowhere close to each other. So they're very, very different. Having things in quotes, this is a string, this is a number. So how do we deal with this? How do we deal with this correctly? Well, one way is to convert the, uh, the number to a string, so explicitly, look it up and I find my value. The small problem here though, let's say that I would actually have stored this value with trailing, uh, leading spaces. Now this one wouldn't work because it will look for one, two, three, four exactly. But maybe I want to find any value, any column that numerically is a one, two, three, four. Well, I can make an explicit conversion of the, of the string to integer, but not with convert, but with try convert. Convert will give an error, if conversion fails, but try convert will say, okay, let's no error, just return null. And therefore, I, oops, I need to select both. Sorry about that. I know I get back that, these. So let's go back to the slides. SQL, it's a statically typed language. So, but there's more implicit conversion than in other languages. So an expression always return one and single data type, it's never going to change, but this implicit conversion may sort of lure to you to think that you don't really have to think about this, but it's statically typed. And if two types meet an expression, one with lower precedence is converted to the type with higher. If there is an implicit conversion at all, if there is not, there will be a compilation error. And it's always better to convert explicitly for clarity rather than relying on implicit conversions. Personally, I, I hate the fact that we have this implicit conversion between strings and numbers. I don't think it serves anyone well in the long run. It's a lot better to get an error up front. Wait a minute, what are you doing? But I think, I, I believe this is actually standard SQL, not only SQL Server. 
So you might ask, what is the precedence list? Well, here is the simplified, the lowest one in the list. It's binary. Then come strings. Then come numbers with, well, within them, indigas, decimal, floating point, date and time, and highest on the list is SQL variant. Here is the complete list for your reference. I'm not going to talk about this, but just if you let, download the deck, you might want to look at this. Now, a um, few more things about we comparing strings. If we do things like this, we comparing a string column to a number or a string column to a, to a date value. Well, this is, will often, very often fail because, because string is so low on the list. There will be some value that would not convert to the other data type. And remember this, yes, 467 with in quotes and without quotes are very, very different. That one is numbers are black, uh, black, strings are red. And so convert number of dates to string explicitly, that one, that's one way out, or use try convert to return null if conversion is not possible. That's a really great thing to do. Now we're going to move over to talk about union and union all. Um, so union is an operator that permits us to combine. We can, uh, loosely said, so we have several queries of the same type. We can combine them into a single result set with a union operator. So here I got, I'm making a new attempt with my config values. It didn't work out with case, but I'm thinking maybe it will work with the union. So I'm saying here, okay, here I, got, I take the integer ones. Here I take the string ones. You see here, so I got the daytime and daytime value on the grid. Selecting these and I hope to get back a single result set. Operand type clash, unique identifier is compatible with daytime. Because when you have a query, um, all values in the same column must be of the same data type because the, the metadata comes per column, not per row. So it must have the same data type. So this is not possible. If I would take out the grid, well, I would get back values. No, because I get this conversion error. Yeah, you see. So how do I deal with this? Well, I need to convert to a common data type. On the previous demo, I used SQL variant. Most people, they will simply use var, a string, var car 10. And it's not as elegant, it's not as fun, good as SQL variant, but it's actually, in my opinion, perfectly okay, perfectly adequate, and it might be even be easier, easier to deal with. Though if you have, let's say, float values, SQL variant is probably better because with means you get a problem. But for these types, not really. So ID, type name, convert the var int value to varchar10. No need, no need for conversion here. Here I convert the date value, car10, data value, I'll need to have a, so I get the right good format that I can use. So I can run this. And now I get back all my queries. Let's talk. Yeah, and also you might notice here that the name of the column in the results, it was value. And I did say as value here. So the, when you run a union query, the, the name of the columns are taken from the first query always. Let's look at this a little more. I've got two tables here, two temp tables. One hash alpha with a column n which I fill in, fill in the values one, two, three, and a um, column hash beta, where I fill in with the values, and a column M, which I fill in with the values three, four, and five. So, and I run a union query here, select N from alpha, union select M from beta. Look at the results. Three only appears once. And why is this? Well, union is a, a known as a set operator, and relational databases are based on set theory. So we are looking at two sets, and we are making the union of these. Now in a set, the same value can only appear once. So the value that appears in the intersection, well, you only get it back once. Uh, but let's look at this a little more. So I'm gonna add uh, three more rows to alpha, but it's the same value, 12, three times, and to beta, I'm gonna add 15, two times. And I'm gonna run my union query again. And now you see, it also removed the duplicates within the sets, within individual sets, not only in the, in the intersection. So that is how union works. Now, maybe I don't want to get, get rid of all these du uh, duplicates. Well, then I can use union all. That actually retains the duplicates. I get back all values. And you may note here, I got an order by n clause here. And when you have order by n and union, it has to be at the end of the entire union query. You can't stick in, in an order by here. That's not permitted. The order n apply, order by applies to the combined query. Now for an interesting observation. When we use relational, relational databases, well, they may be based on set theory, but actually we not really very rarely work with set theory problems as such. We use, we're not working with set theory. We're working with our data. 
we work in them, we use them as a tool to get information about the data. And my experience is that we rarely want those duplicates to be removed. Or we know already that there are no duplicates because we expect the sets to be disjunct. And removing the duplicates, that takes time and resources for the computer because it has to sort the data or perform some other operations to get rid of the duplicates. So union all is what we need 95% of the time. And therefore, I'm thinking, we should always use union all. And if I really want to have distinct values, well, then I should do this. So if you haven't seen this, you can say from, and then you can put a query on here. I'm going to talk a little bit more about this in the next section. And then say select distinct at the outside to make it clear that you want distinct values. Because when I see a query like this, I don't know if the programmer want the distinct values or maybe the programmer was not aware of that union remove duplicates. So if we go back to our config value uh, query, this is how it sh should be written with union all instead. And we can tell, it, we can say it, it wouldn't really matter because we have this idea that this is unique and we all, then we're taking up various sections of the table. So we know that these sets are disjunct, but if you go and look at the query plan for these two queries, you will, for the, this, with union all and union, you will find that they are different. And supposedly, this one is more efficient. I would expect it to be. Let's talk about this a little more. I have two new more tables here called East transactions and West transactions. They have the same structure. There is a transaction ID, there is a name, there is a quantity, and there is a date. But they actually come from different banks, two different banks. So these transactions ID, they're completely unrelated. The persons are the same, and the dates, well, they are related. But these IDs have no relation to each other. Now, if I want to see all transactions, so well, I can run a union query, but I'm, if I'm not aware of union all, oh, I only get back nine rows because it happened to be that Tina, she made a transaction of 10 on both banks on the same day and got the same transaction ID just by chance. So was that a good idea to remove the duplicates? I should have used union all instead to get back all rows. Now, in practice, though, when you do this, you probably want to know from which bank the transaction comes. So you would probably add something like this, a source column, which tells you east, west, and you get back. And now, of course, the rows will always be this junked. So union all or union shouldn't matter, but use union all as a matter of habit. Now, this query here, what does this mean? Well, select name, transaction date from East transactions and from West transactions. Well, I want to know who made transactions on which date. And here it makes sense with union only because if I only want to know the date, well, this is what I want. But again, it's a lot better to wrap this, write a union or query and wrap it in distinct to do this. Get back the same result. And here is a case where it really matters. I want to get back the total of all people's transactions. And I've written here union, some sort of playing that I, don't know what I really what I'm doing. So I'm just saying union because that's natural. Select name quantity from EDB East transactions, union select name quantity from West transaction. And then I'm doing a sum of these. Well, I'm running this, and then I'm gonna see here. Uh, control, shift, enter, I believe it was. Was it all shift enter? Yeah, full screen, so you can see all at once. So let's now look at the total. Adam. That's 34, but look at the source data, 20, 20, and 14. Uh oh, that's wrong. Now, Ben, he has 12, and that's all right. Pat has 43, but Pat has 12, 12, and 31. No, that's not right. And Sue is 19, that's okay. And Tina, 10, no, no, we know he has 10 there and 10 there. Because we ran this with the union, these duplicates were removed. And of course, that was absolutely not what we wanted. Because using union here gave us wrong results. We really need to use union all. Oops. And now, Adam, 54, that's 20, 20, 14. Pat, 55, 12, 12, 31. Tina's 20. So that's the way you need to do it. So union and union all, they combine the result sets of two more queries into a single result set. Column names are taken from the first query. And if the data type is different for the same, uh, for the same column in the individual queries, there will be a conversion according to the precedence rules, just as it does for case. Again, the precedence rules will, will strike. 
And it's always better to convert explicitly for clarity. So you tell what you, yep, this is what I want. So that anyone reading your code can see this. And order by in the union can only be at the end, it applies to the full entire query. Um, union, remove duplicates rows from the result set, including duplicates within the set. Whereas union all will retain duplicates. And my tip, my recommendation is never use union, always stick with union all, because that's what you want 95% of the time anyway. And if you want distinct values, so the few cases where you want this, wrap union all in the outer select distinct to make it clear what you're doing. And keep this in mind that checking for the duplicates comes with the cost of performance. So that alone is a reason to avoid, the, uh, avoid that unless you, you need the distinct values. Now let's talk about derived tables. And we already saw an example of this, but I, let's, I would like to call out a few more things. So I can do this. I can say from, and in this, I can put a subquery. Now this subquery here, first of all, it's completely independent. It's completely isolated from the rest of the query. Now, I don't have any other tables here, but let's say that I had, I would not be able to refer to these tables. It's completely independent. Furthermore, it has to be followed by an alias. If I run only this, I will get incorrect syntax near right parenthesis because I need to have an alias, even if I don't use it. Let's talk about more about these. I'm going to move over to another database called Northgale. Um, this is an order database based on a, well, it's an inflated version of an old demo database from Microsoft. It has 1 million orders. So I uh, got up a little more. And I got this query here where I returned some data about order ID, customer ID, customer name, city, and the total amount of an order. And I have an orders table that I joined to the customers table. And then I got this subquery here which says, logically, compute the sum of all orders in the database, the total amount for all orders in the database, and then join that query to the orders table. And then I want this result for a single date. Now you might think, this, this is not good. Computing the sum for one million orders, that's bad because we only want these for a single day. So that's a lot of extra work. We don't need this. But look now, and again, this is a drive table, and I could not refer to the customer's orders table here uh, by just using the OOC aliases. They're completely invisible. It's completely isolated. Now look here what happened when I run this query. It's fast. I get back the results instantly. Because the optimizer is smart. It sees this. Oh, wait a minute. I can do this. I can find the orders on this particular day because there is an index. Join the order customers table, and then I only run this subquery for the orders I've actually selected. So it's recasting the computation order logically, because remember this, SQL is a declarative language. So um, we tell what this is the result I want, and the optimizer figures out the best way how to do this. So a drive table, it's an independent subquery that you can use in from or join. It cannot refer to anything in the outer query, and it must always have an alias. And it's a logical construct and may not be computed as such because the optimizer may recast the computation order. And it's a handy way to reuse a smaller query in the bigger query. Really great tool to build com more complex queries. Now, let's talk about common table expressions. That's one thing I can see. People use them, but they don't really understand what are these things doing. Ah. They sort of, you can, you can see their head spinning a little bit. Or they get results, but let's try to demystify them. So down here, I got a CT. It starts with with. I'm going to talk about the syntax a little more later. There's a name, order amounts, as, and then I have a subquery or a query. And is, is that exactly the query that I had up here? Again, compute the sum of all orders. And down here, I've got orders, going into customers, and then I stick in the name I have here. So now what is the difference between this query and this query? Well, in this case, this query down here, up here, has a name. That's the difference. What happens when SQL Server passes this query? Well, it's going to take order amounts, and it's going to stick this query in here. This is just a macro definition that I can use for the rest of the query. And when I run this, you see it's fast, because the optimizer again said, oh, wait a minute, I don't run, need to run this full query. I only need to run this for these orders that I found here on this state. So, on the top of your query, you can define one or more CTs. I didn't show an example with, 
with two because I couldn't think of anyone simple enough. But here is an, out, an outline of how you do this. With, with, for the first CT, with the name as, parentheses, select query, end parentheses, comma, next name as, parentheses, etc., and so on. So you can stack a couple of these on top of each other. And the first CT is introduced by with. Now here's a bit of syntax work. So as I said before, uh, in TSQL, semicolons at the end of the line, not using them is deprecated, but they're not mandatory. You can skip these. However, there are a couple of situations where you actually need to use the semicolons. And one is when you have a CT. There must be a terminating semicolon on the line before. And this is because else the parser would be very confused because with appears so many places in this SQL syntax. Um, but, well, you can also put, as you see here, I put the semicolon before with, since I'm not very good at putting semicolons on the end of the statements myself. But whether you do this or not, it's a, it's a matter of taste. And now how you do the, what these CTs are, that depends. So the CT2 and CT3, they can be, well, refinements of CT, you, you might make do something here, then you do something a little more here, etc. But they can also be entirely unrelated. It's up to you. And the CT is just like a derived table. It has a name. That's the one difference. But it, it is a derived table, but with a name. And you can use that name in the rest of the query, just like it was a table or a view. And for each occurrence of that name, the text of the CT is expanded into the query. It is a macro. And that is, it is a logical construct and the optimizer may recast the computation order, and the CT may never be recomputed as such. It's completely logical. And CT is a really great tool to structure complex queries. Uh, whether to use the CT or derive table, that's a matter of taste. Uh, but if you have to nest them or they refer to each other, CTs are more nicely because you can have them on top of each other. A CT, a derived tables with sort of nests, they get more difficult to read. But quite small, short, quick things I tend to do with with write tables. And yes, the scope of the CT is a single query. It cannot be used in queries that follow. I sometimes see people who try to do this, but it would be great if we could define a CT on, let's say for a procedure, we can reuse it in the procedure many times, but that feature is not available. Now, temp tables and table variables. Let's look at these guys. So again, we're doing logically the same thing. Well, I'm setting up a table here called hash order amounts with the columns order amount and amount, or ID and, and amount. And then I'm filling my subquery again, my, 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 sorry, my temp table with my same query again, compute the sum for all orders, and then I'm using my temp tables down here. But this is not a logical thing. We can tell this because when I run this, it takes time. It took five seconds to run this query. So this time, yes, this time, we did compute the sum of all orders and put that in the table because optimization is always within a statement. There is no cross statement optimization. So here, no, no, we're really telling the, the uh, let's go server, do this, stick this result into my temp table and use it. Uh, no, temp tables are great things. They are great, very great at point. So one thing which is important here is because they start with a single hash mark. This means that this table is private to my process. So I can have so other process can go at the same time and also create the table because called hash order amounts. Under the covers, its SQL Server will stick a very long suffix, so that's the actual name we, we never see. So they can be really great tools because sometimes it's very difficult to do everything in one query. We might want to uh, get the data into a temp table, then we can refine it, do updates to it, and so on and so on. But in this case, it was definitely a loser. Uh, we can also use table variables. Looks the same, but slightly different syntax. Declare at order amount, table, order ID and amount. And insert at order amounts. Yeah, I fill it up. And, and I use it down here. So you might guess that this is going to be slower than the CT and the drive table. And indeed, it is, again, it takes time. It takes time. But now we get the result. Oh, wait a minute. The query is still running, although we see some results. It's still running. It's still running and it clocks in at 14 seconds, 14 seconds. So this was even slower than the temp table. But again, because it's a variable, it's private to the process. So we can do this, use this as our private working area and, and we not have to bother about other uses. So temp table, you create them, but you say create temp table, create table name starts with a single hash mark. You can also create table that starts with a double hash mark. Those are global temp tables. 
uh, never use these. They have very, very little practical use. Believe me. A table variables, you can say declare at tvar table. So both of them, they serve the same purpose, working area that's private to the process and not visible to other processes. Very, very useful, believe me. And two processes can create a temp table and declare table or ta declare table variable with the same name that will not be in the conflict. Um, if you define them inside as the procedure, they will go away when the procedure exits. You don't have to do drop table or anything. That, that will be handled automatically for you. Uh, if you define them on top level, there is a difference though. A temp table that you create on top level directly in the query window will be there until you disconnect that window or you say drop table. A table variable only lives for a single batch. So you can only fill it up, but then it's gone. Um, if you create a temp table in the stop procedure or outside the stop procedure, it can then be accessed by in the procedure being called from that scope where you defined it. That can also be useful. You can't do that with table variables. Table variables are only visible where they were declared. Both of them live physically in temp to be, so they both are temp tables. Um, the physical implementation is not really exactly the same. We don't have to bother about the details. Uh, one thing which is important is that there is a myth. Some people believe that table variables are memory only. That's not true. They live in temp to be, they live on disk, or they are backed up by disk. Then they, there are some differences between exactly how much that, that is written to disk, but we don't have to go bother about that. Uh, when it comes to performance, so table variables are known they have a bad reputation when it comes to performance. They often, you often get problems. To the extent, I can give you this tip. If you run into a performance issue, a query is going very slow, and there is a table variable, try to replace it with a temp table. I'm not going to say that it's always going to help, but uh, the, the full story is a lot more complicated. There are situations where you get better performance with a table variable, but it's like a 90-10 division. It's not a 50-50 split. So most of the time, temp table is the right thing. A uh, rule of thumb is that a table variables are okay if you only have a handful of rows. Maybe it's a, just five rows you put in the two, like to put into a table to make it more uh, manageable, and it's a constant set. That's okay for a table variable. But if you don't know, or you could, oh, that would be millions of rows, a temp table, will be a lot better from a performance point of view. Um, that has to do with things I'm not going to cover here, but there are some differences in the implementation. Now, what about CTs versus temp tables? Which is better here? Well, we saw this example. The CT was winning hands down of the temp table. It was so much faster, or the drive table. Because when we use a temp table, well, for an intermediate result, this means that the result has to be computed as such and materialized. Both of them comes with overhead. We have to store that data on the disk, on the table, and we have to compute everything. The, uh, the, the optimizer cannot make any shortcuts. So is the CT always a winner? Well, we can expect it to be faster, but oh, this is a lot more complicated because maybe the CT is very complex or convoluted. So there's no in shortcuts the, the optimizer has to take. It has to compute, compute the results. And now the problem is for, for um, making the best time for the rest of the query, it has not really good idea of what's coming out of that CT. So, it makes the optimize, uh, estimates for the rest of the query completely wrong. And in those situations, it can really help to materialize that CT into a temp table because the temp table has statistics and then the optimizer can, oh, wait a minute, this is a good way to do it and get a, a lot better for the overall process. And when to do this, oh, and also I'd like to point out this. I also like to point out this. So let's say you stack eight CTs on top of each other. I can almost tell you that it's not going to work out well because somewhere this, the optimizer will get lost. And also, you might get lost. You might not get the correct results. If you put in a temp table somewhere on the break it up, that it's going to make your debugging easier. But from a performance point of view, saying when you should do this, when you should do that, this is something you have to learn by experience. Um, go for a CT, start with that. that could, it's in the most cases, or many cases, that will be better. But if you think it doesn't seem to work out very well, use the temp table. Or if you don't just get, make out things, what to actually get out from the CT. Because with a temp table, you can easily look at the results. What did you get? Um, so the list is the last thing I'm going to look at. Temp tables and name resolutions. Well, this is actually the revenge of the table variables. So here, um, I'm going to move over to use let's go to tidbits. And I've got some couple of procedures here that are not very good. They're called bad temp table. Because this was the first one. It uh, creates a temp table called my temp table, and then it does select from my temp table. So it's misspelled. But, I create, but when I create this procedure, it's called services. Oh, I like this procedure, good procedure. 
And here I got one. I, now I'm spelling the table name correctly, but the column here is A, but I'm trying to select B. That's not very smart, but as consumer says, ah, oh, good procedure. That's okay. I like it. And here, well, my temp table, I'm using it. I'm joining it to my customer's table. I'm aliasing my columns, prefixing my columns, like good boy, that's so what I should do. But I've forgotten to define the alias, so this is not a good procedure. But it's conservative says, ah, good procedure. I like it. Accept it. Now, when I try to run it, now I'm told a valid object name, my temp table. I try to run this one. It's valid called name B. And here I've got a whole slew of errors. The multi part of identifier C custom ID could not be bad. So, what's going on here? So, this is the story. When you create a procedure that, that refers to non existing table or table that does not exist, Exclusive says, Oh, wait a minute, that table could appear at runtime. I'm going to stay silent about this. And when you start the procedure, it tries to build a query plan. Ah, Exclusive says, I mean, the, the table might exist at runtime. And that's true, because if I create a temp table, inside the procedure. It does not exist when I create the procedure. It does not exist when I start the procedure. But when I came, come here, it exists. And therefore, things fail. So, in a way, you can say it's good, but way back in SQL 6.5, all of these procedures create, uh, failed to create because they did it differently. It's called the first name and solution, and I don't like it. They could do this in a better way. Now, let's do, do the same thing with the table variables. I tried to create this one. I'm immediately told that must declare the table variable my tim table. And this one, invalid column name B. And now I got these, all these errors directly because this is a declared entity, just like a variable. Well, it is a variable. So therefore, SQL Server figures this out immediately and there is no problem. So that's sort of the revenge of the table variables. But Let's look at this a little more. So first, this is just an introduction to the next thing. So look here, I first create my temp table A, or then I create, create this one with, with the wrong column name. Now I get an error because the temp table did actually exist at this point. Now for the last thing here, and I should warn you, what you're gonna see now definitely is advanced. Uh, this is something that can confuse even very seasoned SQL programmers but there is a lesson. So if you don't understand everything you see, that's all right, but there is a lesson to learn. And that is the lesson I want you to make. So this, hang on. So I got a procedure here called iris P and it creates a temp table, hash temp with the columns A, B, and C. And I do a select from these and I run it and it runs fine. Then I create an outer procedure. It also creates a table called hash temp, but only with the columns A and B. Select this one and calls the inner procedure. And I run it, and you see it runs fine. I get back here, A and B, here, A, B, and C. But now something happens. Let's say the SQL server is restarted, or here, what I'm, what I'm doing here, don't do this in production because this is flattens the entire procedure cache and it could have performance implications. But I'm going to do this for simplicity. So now there is no plan for in P in the cache. I'm going to run my out P again. It worked successfully last time, but now I get invalid column name C. What's going on? Well, at this point, I called out P, which created the temp table, ran that, called in P. No plan for in P in cache, so it has to be compiled. So this statement was compiled against this definition of hash temp, and it failed because there is no column C. Now, there is a moral, moral of this. Don't use names like hash temp, hash T for your temp tables. Don't use these de generic names. Use specific names. If your procedure is about cars, call them hash cars. If your um, so procedure is about vegetables, call them, well, hash cabbage for the cabbage ones, or, well, hash cucumbers for the cucumbers, or whatever. But specific names. So you don't run into this issue very likely, because this is a very confusing scenario and can give you very many gray hairs. Yes. So, Oh, when well, you write a procedure that create, uh, create a procedure that creates a temp table, the temp table that's typically that does not exist at the time. And therefore, to be nice, SQL Server suppresses the error about missing tables. But as I said, they did this differently in 6.5, and I think they could do this better. Uh, why, and why is it helpful? This can serve to mask errors with other tables in the query with a temp table. You saw that in number three. Imagine you have a really big query with well, 150 lines of code, lots of permanent tables, 
And then down in the right corner, there is one single temp table, which does not exist at the time. So the entire query is left uncompiled, and there's all sorts of errors in that query that SQL Server could have told you, told you directly when you created the procedure. Um, and then there was this tip that I told you the last thing here. Attempt to give your temp table specific names. You don't have to go away and use GUIDs. That's cr completely crazy. But to try to avoid generic names like hash temp, hash t, etc. Because so, this can save you from nasty surprises with nested procedures or procedures that fire triggers, etc. And table variables do not have these problems because, well, first of all, they can't nest. And also, if you have an error with a table variable, you would be told up front. So here's an idea. Idea while you're developing. You should use table variables throughout because it helps you to find these errors earlier. But once you're done, once you've done your basic testing, you change the temp tables before you check in and deploy because temp tables will give you better performance. So uh, just going to do a quick summary of what I've talked about. So go, that's not an SQL statement. It's a batch separator. Null, that's an unknown value. And all comparisons with null yield unknown. And use is null or is not null to check for null values. Not in will not give you any results with null values. Use not exist to avoid this trap. And not exist is also good for multi column conditions. And keep this in mind there is no case statement in SQL, there is a case expression. SQL is a statically typed data language. <laughs> Sorry. SQL is a statically typed language. And expressions in the column in the results that always have the same static data type. It's not dynamic. There are, but there are many implicit conversions permitted, which sort of mask this thing a little bit. And they follow a precedence list, which defines which type of wins when you mix types. Union and UNOR permit you to combine two more result sets into a single result set. Union remove duplicates, union all does not. And my recommendation is to always use union all and wrap and distinct in a few cases when you really want distinct values. CTs and derived tables are logical tools to build complex queries. And I stress this again, they are logical tools. There is nothing physical behind them. Um, they're essentially, it's not necessarily computed as such because optimize them in recast computation orders. Temp tables and table variables are private work areas that you can use. And temp tables often give better performance than table variables, particularly with large amounts of data. And CT and derived tables, well, well, I can say they generally faster than temp tables, but exp uh, exceptions are commonplace. So it's maybe a 60-40 split, I don't know. And the last thing we looked at like with temp tables, errors due to misspelling, etc., may not be uncovered until runtime. You don't have this problem with table variables and attempt to give your temp tables distinct names. So this is the final tidbit. My name is Alan Somasco. Here's my email address. Feel, feel free to reach out to me if you have any questions that you don't get answered right here. Slides and scripts are available on my website, somasco.se slash percent. They're also on the data, data platform geeks site. And here's also some links there in, for the building of the demo databases that are included in the download. Uh, for Northgate, you need to run two scripts. So I've done, and I see, I'm moving over to the questions in uh, QA. I see those, those 11 answers for me. Um, let's see. Uh, uh, let's see. Hi, Alan. I found a big work. A quick question. I always wonder in wondering and or statements sometimes need to perform performance. So I had to split into two unions and inputs on the same. Yes. Uh, so or is a troubles, uh, troublemaker. And I of, often find that if I have an org condition of some complex sort that Optimizer can just, just figure it out, but splitting that into union and union all often make wonders with performance. Yes. Um, so let's see. Someone is okay. Where exists and not exists is better in on in and not in clause. Uh, yes, particularly not exists is better than not in because of this trap. Exists and in well, as long as you own a one condition, they're equivalent. But the thing is, with exists, you can have a lot more complex conditions between the outer table and the other one. Um, is there any benefits using exist using of n? Yes, I would say there is. That is, you can have more, more complex conditions because try to write that query with the um, customer responsible who are located in the same city as the customer they are responsible for. I haven't even tried with it. Um, oh, does SQL Server allocate some memory for null values? Uh, oh, that's, uh, 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 well, all values take up memory one way or another uh, in, in a data row. So let's see, 
this this is question that goes answering this one goes far beyond this the scope of this this presentation but if we look at the how it takes on disk so um null value first of all there is a null bitmap and if you have an integer with or something which is of a fixed data type and you don't have any compression um uh, an integer column will take up always four bytes no matter whether it's a value or null for a var car of variable length it's different then it doesn't take up I don't think it, have, it takes up any space at all for null, if I remember correctly. Um, why can't write select? Why can't we write select statement in when condition in case? Uh, we can have uh, you can have a, a select in the when condition. That can be a, a subquery. I had one example with exists, but it can also be a subquery like well, when select count from customers equals twenty, then. So you can do that as well. Uh, here's one. Does the temp table and table variable reside only in memory? As I said, that's a myth. They can spill the temp DB. Yes, they will spill the temp DB if it gets too big. Everything, and oh, I don't know exactly how it's done physically, but you can count on it be, being stored in temp table. And by the way, that also applied for nvarcom max, varcom max. They are designed to be able to spill the disk. So, yes, I came across a scenario where one CT used in query PAMI to send to SPDB mail and the process stuck in the background on SP system, a former query statement limitation, the complexity. Uh, no, uh, it's probably more of a problem with the query as such, not really. It could be that if it didn't happen to you when you ran the query directly, it could be that a slightly different context when it's run in SP send DB mail. Um, there is an article on my website called uh, "Slow in the Application, Fast in the SMS," which discusses with various set options. This is very, this is really confusing. But you can have so the same query you can have multiple query plans depending on uh, various set options and a few more things. That could be uh, the reason. It's hard to say. Um, I haven't played very much. Um, uh, now let's see. I have one here: CT versus merge into temp tables. Which one would be better? Well, now, so uh, I didn't say this during when I talked about performance, but I'm going to say this now. This type, of, this kind of question has a two-word question, two-word answer. It depends, and that's really the, the true answer for many of these performance questions. Particularly, the more gener general they are, it depends. The actual situation will tell you. We look into this, um, uh, and and say what they are different. Now, please explain the difference between lock block and deadlock. Oh, questions. Are, I, so I'm, sorry if I'm going fast, but I'm only got two minutes and the questions are just rushing in. So please explain the difference between lock block and deadlock. Well, a lock, you take a lock of resource. Someone else wants to get the, the same resource. For example, you update the table, you keep the transaction open. Someone wants to let, select that row. That process will be blocked. That's a block. A deadlock is when two processes are trying to, well, so... Let's say this, you updated one row, the other process tried to select that row. Now you try to go and read a row that that process has updated. So you know both waiting for each other. That's a deadlock. You, no one can proceed. And that's the condition SQL Server will detect within, normally within five seconds. But if you only have a blocking situation, that can give on forever. Because a dead, some people, people use deadlock when processes are being blocked for a very long time. But a deadlock is a specific situation where two processes are blocking each other. And how to block deadlock issues, that's a topic of its own. I will have to pass. That's just too wide question. I'm sorry. Does this, uh, this name resolution will be applicable only for stop procedures or any other type of object? Yes. Uh, let's say views are statically. I don't think you can't get temporary because um, they are just a stored query. So there you will be told. But for UDFs, for triggers, they're certainly true. For UDFs, I don't need, they, uh, no, well, you should get an error about a missing table with, the, with UDFs as well. But there are slightly different rules there. Uh, but basically, and also, particularly, it applies to single batch. If you write just, just a script and down on row 50, you've misspelled the table, well, the query will, the script will, down, will run down to, to row 50, line 50, and then it will fail that there. Uh, CT arrive tables, which ones you use for better performance? Oh, sorry, I missed one, but I just taken this. Uh, uh, CT... Um, uh, drive tables, which one to use for better performance? It doesn't matter. CT is a drive table with a name. That is just a matter of how you express your query. Recursive CTs, that must be somewhat more than a subquery with a name, right? Well, yeah, so, well, there is a, um, 
I did stay silent that little part. It's doing things, well, there will be some sort of a spool operator if you go in, uh, and the spool operator is sort of a temp table that SQL Server creates under the cover. But that one, recursive CT will always have something under the cover that runs, that runs the CT. That's, that's correct. Uh, again, as I said, this is a beginner's, beginner session, so I, I did purposely stay silent on more complex part. Um, let's see here. Uh, Oh, that's only five left, so maybe I will get through this. Um, I think we have done the first, uh, yeah, yes. Temp table and table variables stores and temp to be. How come performance issue when only come to table variables when data is huge? Oh, so um, I didn't tell the story, but the thing is something called statistics. Again, this is a beginner session, so I do purposely stay silent. But a table has statistics, which gives information about the distribution of the data, how many rows there are, etc. A temp table has statistics, and that helps the optimizer to do things. A table variable only has one piece of statistics, the cardinality. And also, there are uh, uh, limitations with a table. Uh, so that's one reason you get worse performance with a temp uh, table variable, because the... Um, the um, Optimize not know. And also, up to SQL 2017, a query would typically be compiled with assuming one row in the table. They changed that in 2019, so now it will actually defer compilation of a table variable until you come to that statement and will use the number of rows. But there are also, um, in this particular example, the reason the table variable was slower is that table variables do not permit parallelism. So the, the query with a temp table uses parallelism, the one with a table variable does not. Oh, so when. Will there be a performance difference between left join and not exist when the left table is just being used to verify? Yes, there can be a performance difference in either direction. It depends, but I guess some, and it's, to some extent, I, some people I work with, they use left join for everything because at one point, oh, we got a lot better performance with left join than not exist. Let's use left join. But it might be the other way around the next time. I, my, uh, my preferred way, I prefer using not exist because if that's all I want, because it makes, the query so much, uh, it, it expresses much better what I want to do in that query. Um, and does CT has statistics? No, because CT is a logical construct, so there's nothing we can have statistics. And that's the reason also, when you have these convoluted CTs on top of each other, that's why the optimizer doesn't figure, thi figure things out. Oh, <laughs> sorry, I have to catch my breath. There was a lot of questions here. Um, I'm thinking I'm Done my time, it's time for the break. I'm running over for two minutes. I'd really like to thank you for listening to this. I hope you enjoyed it. I'd like to thank um, Amit, Sanjay, and Arti, and all the other people for arranging this, for making this event possible. And uh, I would really love to speak to you again. I actually did speak to you for two weeks ago, but I don't mind coming back. So thank you very thank you. much for listening. Thank you. Thank you very much, Arlen, for taking out time uh, and uh, delivering this wonderful talk with all the demos. And yes, of course, when you come online, there will be never ending questions. Trust me on that. <laughs> so thank yeah. you. Because last week, I think last time I only had like two questions to this, time, which was just woo, a rush. Absolutely. Uh, absolutely. I'm really sorry for people if I answer your questions very rapidly, but there was, there was more questions than I expected. Yes, yes. And of course, uh, common questions that are coming, of course, we will uh, share all the slides and the code snippets to you uh, next week. And uh, yes, recordings are also, we're trying to see if recordings are also happening because yesterday we had a huge stream, a big 11 GB file and whatnot. So we got to do a bit of uh, post-processing uh, work. And so we'll try to make as much resources uh, possible and we'll make them available to the community. Thank you, Arlen, for your time. Thanks. And you have a good day, uh, the rest of it. Yep. Thank you very much. And I, by, by the slides, so my, uh, on your, they're all available on my yes. website, that link, if someone's going to say slash present yes. for those who are impatient. Okay. Thank you very much, Amit. And I hope enjoy the rest of the if day. If someone wants it immediately, you can always go to uh, Erlen's website. Uh, that is uh, somerscog.se slash present.